Uh, so we're going to continue our discussion of reactions of uh, transition metals. I mean, generally any metals, but transition metals are the ones that typically do these types of reactions with. Um, the first reaction we're going to look at today is the um, insertion reactions. But I I think it, any mo most practitioners in the field would say it's better to call these migratory insertion reactions. I should be careful there. That's my preference is that we call these migratory insertion reactions. I believe there are some folks out there that actually just call them insertion reactions and just deal with it. Okay, anyway, so migratory insertion reactions, what happens is, is this is kind of, well, I won't even relate it to a previous reaction. Let's just, let's just talk about it. What happens here is a pi bond um, inserts between a metal and a ligand bond. Okay, so the pi bond inserts between a metal ligand bond. What that looks like is if we take our metal and our ligand, doesn't matter what the oxidation state is right now, we're gonna have a pi bonded system, which is A double bonded to B. And then what I want to do is migratory insertion. What's happening here is the is A and B are now only singly bonded to each other. And now B is bonded to a ligand and A is bonded to a metal. And we could flip which one is bonded to the metal or the ligand, depending on the type of reaction that we're doing, or you know, depending on all the players, depending on what the metal is, depending on what A and B are, that sort of thing. Now here, you know, unlike oxidative addition and reductive elimination, I think it is helpful to have some arrows involved. It just really helps me kind of see what's happening here, even if they're not the most accurate depictions. It again, helps me organize my thoughts a little bit. So I'm gonna call these helpful arrows as opposed to like strictly mechanistic arrows. I guess curly arrows are always just sort of helpful for us organizing our thoughts as we're thinking about transformations. Anyway, metal bonded to ligand, <clears throat> A is positioned over A double bonded to B, and then we just do two arrows moving in either direction to show the breaking of the double bond to make only a single bond between A and B, single bond between A and B. And now each of B and A are singly bonded to a metal center. This allows for kind of the conservation of the number of metals. And again, I'm gonna call this our MI or um, migratory insertion. Now this is a nice reaction for many reasons. It first of all, allows us to make a bond between our um, metal center and our uh, a bond between our metal center and something on A and B. So um, a nice kind of starter approach to this, not like technically the exact same. Um, well, I mean, let, let's, yeah, a nice starter mechanism is to remind ourselves about the palladium catalyzed hydrogenation. So um, MI or migratory insertion is involved in the palladium catalyzed hydrogenation of alkenes. And so um, what happens here is we can actually propose a mechanism, now that we know this, we, we can actually propose a mechanism for palladium catalyzed hydrogenation. So let's pick a really nice example is one where we've got, <clears throat> well, let's just pick cyclohexene. It turns out the, the end result won't matter so much because we'll be a chiral, but we can at least see something. So what I'm saying is, is we're going to take palladium H2, react that with cyclohexene. Palladium is going to be bound to carbon for stability and delivery issues. And hydrogen atoms are going to be cis to each other in the final product. Turns out we won't be able to like see that unless we did a radioactivity activity labeling, but I do wanna keep things, I don't wanna let things get too complicated on us. Okay, so let's propose a mechanism. Well, the mechanism is first going to involve the palladium zero forming a sigma complex through a ligand association event with H2.
We talked about this last time. Palladium maintains its oxidation state, but now it has a sigma complex as opposed to a pi complex to H2, but this is prone to undergoing a um, oxidative addition to form palladium two plus and two monovalent H's being added. If you notice, we go from 10 electrons overall to 12 electrons overall to 12 electrons overall. Okay, so we're at 12 electrons overall. Palladium's changed its oxidation state, lost its D electron count. We talked about that stuff last time. Now what I want to do is I'm going to adduct with the cyclohexene. This is a ligand association event again. This time, instead of forming a sigma complex, we're going to form a pi complex. Okay. Now the outcome here is, we're still two electrons, we're now 14 electrons. So you can see why the palladium is gonna to wanna to do this. It's getting closer and closer to its 18 electrons. So it's just trying to pick up ligands as it goes. So what do we do at this point? Well, at this point, we're going to do the migratory insertion and you'll get a taste for why this is one of the more, com more useful but cumbersome reactions to, to try to picture. What's gonna happen here is we have A and B double bonded to each other. In this case, A and B are both carbon carbon bonds or carbon carbon atoms. So these are going to be, A and B are right here, which I've shown in dots. They were double bonded to each other. They've just formed a pi, pi complex, but th that's our double bond. Now we need to do is have one of those elements bonded to the metal, the other one bonded to one of the metal's ligands. In this case, it's the hydrogen atoms. The hydrogen is going to be the ligand and the metal is going to be the palladium, which is also bonded to hydrogen. Palladium is still plus two. Now, if you look, we're back to 12 electrons overall in the complex. So migratory insertion does seem to decrease that total electron count for us. And you go from a um, pi complex down to a monovalent complex, and you've also lost another monovalent complex. So you go, to, you go down to electrons when you do a migratory insertion. So that's what this is. This is migratory insertion. Now, because we form that pi complex, it's kind of tricky to draw those arrows. But if we had to draw the arrows maybe over here, I'm going to draw my double bond and my palladium and my hydride. There's hydride sticking off over here, I don't really care about. But there's my two arrows. If I want to bypass the ligand association step, I, I don't take into account the fact that I need to form a pi complex probably to get there. Okay, <clears throat> so what have we done so far? We've done a migratory insertion but we haven't like, we haven't really um, gotten back to our product, right? We haven't made our product. We haven't regenerated the palladium, which is a catalyst for the reaction. So it's at this stage, we can actually do reductive elimination. Reductive elimination, I'm not gonna draw curly arrows for. But reductive elimination allows me to generate a new bond between carbon and hydrogen after we deliver that first hydrogen and I get back my palladium zero center, okay? So this is a nice mechanism for the um, palladium catalyzed hydrogenation of alkenes. I suppose um, another depiction is you could have kind of a simultaneous migratory insertion and um, a simultaneous migratory insertion reaction. I'm not, I'm not clear how effective this is in terms of orbitals. Like I'm kind of a fan of the more stepwise process that involves the traditional transformations. But if you had, you could seemingly draw arrows like this, where you go kind of chelyotropic in a sense, where you push the electrons onto the bond. And that gives rise to a product where the palladiums are delivered to each face. So I'd have to read more into this. I'm kind of more of a fan of the previous mechanism, despite the simplicity um, of the one I've just drawn. Okay, moving on. 
let's kind of reflect on <coughs> what we were able to do here with this other mechanism. The migratory insertion reaction allows us to form bonds between palladium and carbon and hydrogen and carbon at the same time. So it's a pretty powerful reaction because it allows us to take a pi system and form two bonds from the metal complex. Okay, so that's just an example. Now, the reverse of this process is beta elimination. So beta elimination is again the reverse of migratory insertion. So the reverse of migratory insertion. So we could even draw some arrows to this, but typically what we need is we need A bound to B. These are gonna be pi bonded to each other. We need metal bonded to some sort of potentially future monovalent ligand. It's typically hydrogen. Okay, anyway. So here we're going to do beta elimination. And where the name comes from is that you're doing an elimination which makes an alkene. And the beta means the position of the ligand. It's not on atom A, which is directly attached to our metal, rather it's on atom B. So we'll use the Greek letter for B, beta, okay. So here, we're going to take our arrows in the opposite directions that we did for the migratory insertion to form A, B double bond plus M single bonded to L. Okay, so um, this is a uh, just, just a reverse reaction. There are some interesting um, examples of this, but uh, I guess, you know, one, one that comes to mind is you typically have, if you've got some metal bound to a carbon and a carbon, and you have a hydrogen next door, you can actually form an alkene through beta elimination, where you convert a metal, you form a metal hydride and you convert a singly bonded system into a pi bond. So this is um, sometimes, I'd say half the time, this is undesired. There are some important reactions that generate alkenes. I mean, alkenes are important functional groups, but if I already got the metal on there, you typically don't want to generate the metal hydride at the end of the day. Uh, we'll get into an example in the Heck reaction. So half the time it's undesired, half the time useful. And this would be the case of um, the Heck reaction. Depends if you want an alkene at, out at the end of the day. Typically, if we're involving a metal center, we it's often the case that we don't. <clears throat> okay, so that's kind of what I want to say um, about uh, these systems. I mean, I, I could show you another another interesting um, beta elimination reaction. So if we have this system and we react it with magnesium. So it turns out that this will engage magnesium to make ethylene or ethene, where the magnesium first does an oxidative addition reaction to insert itself between a bromine atom and a carbon atom. Now the negative charge here sort of recognizes the negative character that this carbon atom recognizes it actually has a good leaving group next door. So it could peel back the bond between carbon and magnesium to make a carbon-carbon double bond. And that's gonna shove off our bromine leaving group to give us this species. And this species will just adduct with Br minus to give magnesium bromide. It's kind of an interesting way to generate magnesium bromide from magnesium ribbon in the absence of water. So, and sometimes it's useful for activating some, some uh, magnesium that you wanna chew into. Um, anyway, we'll just kind of mention that as a potential uh, reaction. Okay, so let's move into the next set of reactions. So these are two of the big hitters and these capture the, the six most important reactions that we'll see in, um, that we'll see everything else that I'm gonna show you is sort of 
um, another example of that. And so let's actually just pick up with one and then we'll save uh, the next one for a separate video. The next one I wanna mention is, is I, I would put it as like a number seven for, for important reactions of metal complexes because it's hugely important for understanding cross coupling reactions. Um, but it's just kind of a, just a ligand substitution reaction of sorts. I, I could take a lot of flack for that. But um, so this is sort of a ligand substitution, but it's through a process um, called metathesis. Metathesis is an important word. It's gotten a lot of buzz because early in my PhD, people won, um, um, uh, several folks won Nobel prizes for a special type of metathesis that we'll talk about next time. So in metathesis, what we're doing is we're swapping groups. So transmetallation is kind of swapping metals. Okay, so what we do in transmetallation is we have one metal that's attached to a ligand, call it M1 attached to L1 plus M2 attached to L2, so another metal center attached to a different ligand, and we do transmetallation, which is a metathesis process where you swap, and metathesis is where you swap groups. Now, we're not going to form a metal-metal bond, but we're going to form a metal-ligand bond that's new. Obviously, there's an equilibrium that could exist here. So here, we're just swapping what's attached to what. Okay, so a common approach to this is to use main group metal systems with transition metal systems. So let's look at an example of this. Let's say we've got palladium and the palladium has undergone an oxidation reaction with some sort of halo iodide, okay? Now what we can do is we can react this metal complex with some metal that's attached to a lithium. So in organolithium, which we've talked about before as being strong bases, here it's going to be an interesting reactant for us. What we're going to do is we're going to swap this for this. Palladium is not super willing to give up its carbon bond, but halogens are easy to kind of let go of. Okay, so we're going to do a transmetallation reaction. And now palladium is going to be attached to R prime and R because the lithium is now attached to the iodide. So we've metathesized this reaction. We swapped the things that are attached to it. And as a result, we have now a new R group bound to our palladium. And so down the road, we could do a reductive elimination and go from palladium two plus to palladium zero plus R prime and R. So you don't change the oxidation state of the metal centers that undergo the transition, the uh, transmetallation. We just kind of swap their groups and, you know, due to some sort of equilibrium constraints, the palladium prefers to be bonded to carbon. Here, the lithium iodide is a nice stable ionic complex, ionic salt. And so we have our driving force for the formation of our products. Okay, so that'll do it for this reaction. We'll look at metathesis reactions in a lot more detail in the next lecture before moving on to cross-coupling reactions. Okay, so that'll do it for this one. Um, so uh, for now, I'll see you next time.